It's so lovely to be here. It's so nice to see all your faces and to do something in person and face to face. Um, I'm Dr. Rada Modgill. I'm the ambassador lead for National Academy for Social Prescribing. It's a real honour to be part of the Academy. It's a real honour to be part of this incredible community of people like you who are doing fantastic work across the country to support people and enable people to change their stories and their lives. And I'm really delighted, actually, to be here with two fantastic panellists who I'm going to introduce in a second, because this panel is all about communicating the power of people's stories. And I'm also a GP, so I hear a lot of people's stories in my practice. I also do media and broadcasting work around wellbeing and particularly mental health. And in that role, I hear a lot of people's stories. I hear a lot of people who are lonely, who feel isolated, and who don't really know where to go. And so I know the power of connecting people through their stories and the power that actually people find within themselves when they hear about someone else's story being similar or having similar elements to their own. So I'm really thrilled to be here. This panel is going to be all about communication, um, connection, and social prescribing just does that so well. And social prescribing actually helps people, enables people to change their story and to live the life that they want to lead. So I'm really thrilled to be here. Thank you for listening. Thank you for being part of it. It's going to be interactive. I want to make this engaging and exciting, and I want you to all get something from it. So without further ado, the best stories are always told by the people themselves. So I'm going to start the panel off by showing a little montage clip of podcast on prescription. I hope you've all listened. If you haven't, then check it out. It's a podcast that I've been really honoured to do as part of the National Academy for Social Prescribing. And we've heard some incredible people. We're on our second season. Um, so without further ado, let's hear a little bit from that series. And I went to see my doctor that day and he actually said, you know, you're suffering from mild depression. Do you want to take some, some drugs? And I said, I'm, I'm not taking drugs. And he said to me, well, if you're not going to take any drugs, then whatever you love, go and do more of it. And that was the best thing that anyone had said to me up until then. You know, I just went home, got my binoculars and went to uh, Worm with Scrubs. And it was birding and it was nature that actually pulled me out. very much realizing that it, it it has made a huge difference in my life uh, it's sometimes uh, you, some, it gives you a focus I think the word I'm trying to use it, it, it sometimes gives you a focus that you just need to just say do you know what I need to shake off whatever it is I'm feeling right now and just take to the streets to the road to the pavements to the pathways to the park whatever it is use my feet and just get a little bit of energy going through me and uh, and allow my thoughts and my feelings just to exist, but in the space of something different, in the space of an activity where I can just flow with it. And I think they're helping others because it became so apparent to me how through the running, you know, we raise so much money for charity. People raise such a lot of money. Through, through running and doing events and sponsorship and donations. And, mm. and that does make such a difference to other people's lives. I mean, one of the saddest and nicest stories um, was um, I went to pick a, a lady up and um, I'm driving her thing, thing and she's in, in her eighties and she just pulls the mask down a little bit and she says, you picked my friend up last week, didn't you? I said, oh, how, how do you know him? She said, well, she said, uh, my husband and him, and uh, they met in the uh, vets in about 1953. They both had the cats, they got chatting, oh, wow. and they became friends. And the four of them, the four, uh, two couples, would go to this club twice a week, and uh, they got on for like 50 years, you know? Wow. And they both had lost their partners in the recent years, but they still met and went to the club together on a Tuesday and a Saturday. And uh, he described, she described, um, she would walk to the end of her road, he would cross the road and meet her then. They would walk up to the club together and they would go for drinks and they'd come back. So I said, oh, I said, that's lovely that you still did that. She said, yeah, but we've not, 
we have not done it for a year, obviously. I said, oh, what do you do instead? She said, well, we speak on the phone every now and then, but it's not the same. I said, have you not, not seen him? She said, no. I went, come on. I went, I've got somebody here for you. And she was on the drive in the car and they put the window down and they were like, oh. they had a big chat. I felt like a gooseberry, even though they were not that's romantically so involved. Lovely. Yeah, that's but it was nice. great. It was such a, and that, you know, that's, that, that made my week. You know, that was, that was, you know, I got as much joy out of that as they did. What we want to tell are the stories of everyone's heritage and to be able to engage with, you know, what people like us experienced in the past and know where we came from, but, but also what other people have um, experienced. I feel that history is very good at putting one's life in perspective <laughs> and, um, you know, exploring past lives and realizing that, realizing that other people in the past, um, as the great historian G.M. Trevelyan once put it, live lives as actual as our own, is a, a sort of wonderful tonic for life. I, I rung my mum and told her, and, and actually my me, me, me mum was upset that she said, Right, I'm walking up to the GP. Uh, while you're on the way home, I want you to ring them and tell them what you've told me, and I'll see you there. So that's what I did. I rung the GP, and the GP said, right, come straight here, uh, and we'll have a talk. So that's what I did, and, and, and I will be forever thankful for my GP. Uh, she's, my GP is, is amazing. Uh, she is part of the process in, in saving me, in bringing me back, uh, you know, and she will always say, like we all do, rather, oh, I haven't done anything, you've done it all. But she has, because she listened to me and she understood and she said, right, we're going to sort this out. So an incredible set of clips, um, the incredible Daz Dealer finishing off there, who's just brilliant because what he did was he went and took all of that energy and that GP who enabled him to change his story in his life and he took that and he became a link worker himself and is now helping people and enabling people to change their own stories. That's absolutely fantastic. And a bit of a plug, we've got a link worker special coming out next week, next Wednesday, to celebrate all the link workers to champion what they do. So I hope you can all tune into that next Wednesday. Um, but on to the panel today. Um, this is all about people's stories and social prescribing really, I think, enables people to change their stories on an individual level like we've just heard, on a regional and community level, but also on a national level. And so I'm going to look at those three levels in the panel today. And I've got some brilliant projects, some brilliant guests I'm going to be showcasing. Um, what I'd like you to do is, again, you've got your postcards with you in, in your packs. Please think about what is your story within social prescribing? What's your journey been? What stories have you seen and how have they impacted you? How have they impacted other people you've worked with in your community? And please get writing those down. Please share those on the board outside afterwards. Please share them on social media using our hashtag because we want to get people talking. We want to make sure people are actually hearing people's stories. So without further ado, we're going to move on to how individuals' stories can be enabled and supported through social prescribing. And my first guest is with me. She's fantastic. Um, she's called Katrina Gargett and she's a community engagement officer who runs the Archaeology on Prescription project. And that project is all about improving the well-being of the city of York's residents through archaeology, helping foster social connections and build confidence with new skills. So thank you so much, Katrina, thank for coming on the panel today, coming all the way down from York. Uh -huh. Yes, it's so nice to be here. <laughs> now, tell us a little bit more about your projects and more importantly, how does it actually change people's lives and their own stories from what you've seen? Oh, I don't know where to begin. <laughs> That's such a big question. Um, so the, the project itself um, is still sort of in its pilot phases. Um, we kind of got back, I got back from being furloughed for a long time after the pandemic in April last year and kind of 
so, so I went head first into um, developing a, a social prescribing project using archaeology and um, because I, it's well documented that kind of engagement in heritage can improve um, health and well-being and we wanted to look at how we could um, use that with social prescribing and um, so I kind of got in touch with um, local uh, non-statutory project partners rather than sort of jumping in head first with kind of co connecting with link workers and things um, and we set up a partnership with two um, local uh, charitable organizations so one of those is Converge um, who are based at York St John University and they work with students with mental health difficulties mm -hmm. and the other is Changing Lives who I'm sure many people know work with people recovering from addiction and we um, just said, hey, do you want to um, come down and do some archaeology um, and get involved and see kind of what the um, health and well-being benefits of that will be um, and make new friends um, and kind of just sort of have a go. So um, we set up our first nine week pilot that ran um, from September to November in the autumn of last year. Um, we were very kind of particular in that we wanted to offer a sort of range of archaeological activities and also creative activities to enable the participants who came down onto site to sort of take a bit of agency and do what they wanted to do based on their own interests and their own needs in the past mm -hmm. um, and in archaeology and um, it was it the response was just incredible it was amazing so tell me a bit more about the response when you say it's incredible what happened what what did you see what did you see on the ground in terms of what people felt about that project and how they interacted with it well first and foremost it was kind of um we had so much enthusiasm for the people that were coming onto the project because we were sort of aiming it at people who'd never had an opportunity to have a go at archaeology and so many of them on that kind of very first week were saying i can't believe i'm here like this is amazing i never thought that i'd be able to get into a trench and pick up a trowel yeah. and actually you know try and find something um and that enthusiasm just sort of built and built and built as as the, the pilot went on and uh, sort of across those nine weeks um but i think that particularly for the staff um, ourselves who were delivering it, we weren't quite ready for just how much of a profound impact it was going to have on those participants um, because they they really, um, they just blossomed really. They they made new friends that sort of still keep in touch now, which is incredible. Wow. Um, they sort of developed their skills and their knowledge um, and they learned so much about the past and that really kind of fostered this sort of sense of belonging. Um, and they, they noted at the end of that nine weeks that they'd really experienced that kind of positive increase in well-being um, from just coming onto site every week, having a go, um, you know, finding objects in the ground, whatever that might be, experiencing that sense of discovery, that sense of wonder that comes with archaeology, um, and also being a part of something bigger in this sort of shared pursuit of discovery. Wow, I love that. And I suppose also, when we hear the word archaeology, we automatically think of something quite grand, something exotic, something abroad, yeah. but actually to kind of maybe reframe that idea about what, what archaeology is and how the past can influence us in terms of our local area, in terms of really small objects and just the whole point of discovery, I suppose. I'm always really interested in how, um, how that kind of bigger theme is reflected in an individual's life and their story. So I suppose as they were discovering objects, do you feel like they were discovering a bit more about themselves and who they were as well? Yeah, I think so. I think because archaeology is, is fundamentally about people. Um, it's about, you know, it's about people in the past and what we can discover through the objects that we're finding and the evidence that we have so that we can learn and understand better about who those people were that came before us. Mm -hmm. And I think through doing that and through sort of finding these objects and, and using their imagination to think about who those people were and what kind of lives they might have led and were their lives different to theirs or were they very similar to theirs? Did they face the same kind of challenges? It sort of allows you to reflect on your own life and your own experiences um, and how that's kind of brought you to where you are today. Um, and I think just through having those kind of really open conversations with the participants in the trench about those people who came before and who was using that piece of pottery that was just, just discovered and what their life might have looked like, they really began to open up about their own lives and the challenges that they'd faced. Um, and there was this real sort of sense of camaraderie and sort of a sense of belonging and coming together in kind of that shared social connection. So it was really, really powerful. Mm, wow. And they also, I suppose, have created their own shared story within their group now yeah. of, that, of that activity, those, those weeks they spent together. And that's also part of their story and continues to be because obviously, as you said, they're all still in touch, which is amazing, which is what social prescribing is all about. Yeah which is fantastic. Um, I know that you've got a brilliant video that yes. you kindly have 
agree to share with us. Can you just tell us a bit about the video before we watch it? Yeah, so the video um, is one of our lovely participants who um, came onto the project um, called Nelly. Um, and she um, has uh, quite uh, challenging disabilities and she spends quite a lot of time in bed, as you'll hear us sort of describe on the project, but she'd never um, had a, a chance to have a go at archaeology and it's sort of always been one of her passions. So um, when she kind of heard through Converge that this was an opportunity, she, she just said, you know, she had to come down and you'll see from the video, she, you know, she really kind of overcame um, a lot of her kind of own challenges and really took agency over her experience as well. Um, not only did she have a go at excavating, but she also took the lead on a collaborative arts project that they did on, on site as well, um, looking at sort of their experience of the site and the, the sort of layers of archaeology and things like that. So yeah, it's a really inspiring video and I hope you all enjoy it. That's amazing. Thanks so much. We're going to have a look at it now, I think. How did you get involved in the project? Oh, it was through Converge and uh, I just, it, they've got lots of options and I was just like, oh, this one, I've got to do this one, I've got to do this one, it just sounds so amazing. <laughs> <laughs> so have you enjoyed your time then? I know, it's been horrible. Oh yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's amazing, I absolutely loved every minute of it. In fact, started off as one afternoon a week and the last couple of weeks I've been three days a week. And uh, for me that's just unbelievable because I spend so much time having to be in bed mm -hmm. um, and to be able to say that not only have I been out of bed but I feel like I've learned so much and I have got just a new, some new friends as well and it, the team are just amazing to work with there's so much laughter and learning and they're so knowledgeable and I just can't express enough how much I love being part of this team, it's, it's amazing. And um, I just spoke to my doctor now and he said, what? And I was like, yeah, 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 just starting again in, in, in next year. So you gotta, you gotta tell people about it. <laughs> Cause he couldn't believe that it was on prescription. So I was like, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I really don't want to tell people about it though, you know, cause I want to come back. <laughs> <laughs> so what's been your favorite part? Hmm. Or your favorite moments? I can't tell you one, I can tell you a couple because between the two, they're two completely different things. Whilst I was digging, I found something. But what was the best one was when I was washing um, the finds, I was just like, oh my God, this is amazing. And I found a tile with two fingerprints on the end of it. And some, I think it was grass marks. And it was just like, oh, I'm holding something that somebody made and they can actually see their fingerprints. And it was just, what a connection. Yeah. That has just like made my day. So that's the archaeology side of it in terms of, you know, the actual dig and the finds. Mm -hmm. um, but for actually being able to do the art project that has been inspired by one of my friends helped me brainstorm what would be a good idea. Um, and she's really chuffed that I've done it and I've been sending her pictures of, you know, going along with it. So yeah, so being able to do all that. Whilst having, I have to say, whilst having a disability, that everyone's just accepted me as I am and just a crazy person that I can be. And I've loved every single second. I am so sad that I get a cut. I'm so sad that it's finishing today. Mm. For me, anyway. I'm going to give you a big hug in a second. Yeah. But um, that's it. Is there anything else that you wanted to say? Thank you, thank you, thank you. <laughs> wow. Wow, what a reaction, what a story, what a transformation as well. And, and something like you say that people, they've now become a group and they're now in touch with each other ongoing. Um, thank you for sharing that with us and thank you to Nelly and thank you to everyone who is working on that project and has worked on that project. Um, just before I leave you, is there one sort of standout moment that you would take from that pilot in terms of the power of connecting people and their stories and what you've seen it, it sort of enable people to do in their own lives? Oh, I think one standout moment's hard because there's, there's so many in my head. I think every day was just kind of, there was so, there was so much fun, like Nelly said, and there was so much laughter. And um, I think, you know, through that and kind of breaking down the barriers and, and making everybody feel welcome, um, we just, there were so many moments where people really opened up about kind of things that they found challenging um, and that they were, the difficulties they were facing in their lives that they, they, said that they never would have 
known that they would get to that point where they felt like sharing that with with someone mm. um there was one particular participant um who rang me after the end of the the first um nine weeks and um i'll, I'll never forget it because i was walking through town and it was raining and it was such a horrible day and mm. i had um not the best day in the office <laughs> um missing be being out on site and <laughs> she rang me um and she just said i just i just want you to know that um you've completely changed my life she was like i don't I don't know if you knew, but I had really bad agoraphobia um, from the, pan the pandemic. Um, and she she never had a chance, a bit like Nellie, ne never had a chance to kind of get out and do archaeology, but it had always been a passion of hers. Um, and she said, I feel so much more confident to leave the house now because, wow. because of this project and because you all made me feel so welcome and you made me realize that it's not as scary, the world isn't as scary a place as I thought it would be. And, and she was in tears on the phone and I was in tears on the phone <laughs> and it was just that, that moment that was kind of like, you know, archaeology has that power and yeah. through social prescribing we just want to change as many people's lives as we can. That's incredible and I bet your day was a lot better after that. It well. was, yeah, <laughs> the rain didn't matter after that. <laughs> well listen Katrina, thank you so much, thank not just you. for your work but for coming here today and sharing that story with us as well. Thank Thanks you to so everyone who works with you as well. I'm going to move on now to that other level of community and regional impact in terms of the story of a community and a region that's been impacted by social prescribing. And I'm really thrilled that Anne Dement has joined us today. Thank you for being patient, Anne. It's, really <laughs> it's really nice fun. to have you here. Um, so Anne is the Thorin Community Spark Somerset Projects Creativity and Wellbeing Coordinator, um, all the way from Somerset that you've come. So thank you so much for being here today. Um, can you just tell us a little bit about your projects and importantly, how the story of your community and your region has been transformed by social prescribing. Thank you, Rada. It's a pleasure to be here and hear all these wonderful positive stories. Um, yeah, um, Thriving Community Somerset was uh, funded by the Thriving Communities Fund from NASP, and um, the, the, the aim of the project is to uh, strengthen and build the social prescribing networks that are already there um, because um, Somerset's divided into four different district councils, and in each district there were things happening, but they weren't being connected. So the aim of this project was to um, support the people most impacted by COVID and, and long-term health conditions by helping to facilitate and strengthen those networks. So um, we started with um, simple having roadshow events for one in each region and to get all the people in the same room talking like today, everyone talking and sharing stories and knowing what's already there and making new connections and forming new ideas to see what what they could take forward and build new collaborations mm. which were very successful we had 159 people attend all four events unfortunately one was only in, only one was in person because of the, the restrictions um but we we had um, about over 90 different organizations represented so link workers commissioners funders the health watch organization were there the Somerset community foundation and also the the smaller um, activity providers who don't normally have a voice, but they, they were there and they shared what they do. So everyone understood and, and it was really powerful. Mm -hmm. it was it sounds really powerful. And just like we've been hearing how individuals have been kind of knitted together and connected together through social prescribing, it sounds like your region was actually knitted together and connected through social prescribing as well because of those events and because of people coming together. Yeah, and actually I say only one was in, in person, but actually being online was, was a sort of a benefit because they were recorded on, on, on Zoom. So people who, who from any region of Somerset could actually watch or attend. And also because of the difficulties in travel and obviously the restrictions on people accessing live events, it gave people, more people the opportunity to attend the events. So mm. it had a wider impact. Mm. So in, in practice, if we're, if we're looking at different aspects within a community, within a region, obviously mm. there are so many different aspects of well-being, different organisations, different people, um, and, and different, um, I suppose, environments that people will come across as individuals in their own lives. Can you give us some examples of how those different elements in the community were actually brought together on sort of practical terms? Yeah, so, so apart, as, as well as the roadshow events, which we gave people an opportunity to try out some of the social prescribing activities that we were going to be supporting, our, our project funding also had um, money to commission activities. And in my, my role, which um, 
it was quite challenging, but um, in, 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 eight, <laughs> in eight months or 10 months, I had to identify and commission and support the activities to, to be set up and, and run. Mm -hmm. So we've supported seven projects. And the, the initial aim was to try and do some in every region of Somerset, so allow every area of the county to experience a, an activity, mm -hmm. but also to um, work with existing and new providers and provide new collaborations. So um, just for example, we, um, we set up a Thriving Voices Choir, which um, obviously knows the benefits of singing, but we connected with the Long COVID and the Respiratory Rehab teams who were working extremely hard in, 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 in the last few years. You had a lot of patients who have been isolated and unable to leave the house, but we managed to set up two choirs in Burnham on Sea and in Taunton. And these people were able to get out and actually learn about breathing control and, and connect with other people and, and sing. And they've actually managed to get funding to carry on those choirs, which is, is amazing. Mm -hmm. um, I, new partnerships, um, we connected Somerset Artworks, which is an arts organisation with Somerset Wildlife Trust and um, the Mind Arts Group, which was existing, but they were struggling to get people to, to uh, uh, attend. And they, they worked together and we put those together to do an arts and nature um, course and I was there on Tuesday mm -hmm. and speaking to the participants and you know they they it's not just about doing the art activity it's about they said it's about having a cup of tea with people about connecting there, mm -hmm. there was a lady I spoke to who had epilepsy and she wasn't able to leave the house without somebody to give her a lift because she couldn't drive and Somerset's quite a rural community as well so transport is quite a challenge to access activities and um, so just the, the being able to access a group once a week and and also they got taken out to the local um, the Quantock Hills um, and natural uh, to, to do um, experience in the natural environment as well and do nature based mm -hmm. activities. And um, I've got some wonderful stories from um, Meads and Marshes with the Meads is a, a wetland site in Bridgewater, which Bridgewater is quite a it's quite an interesting place, but um, it's quite a it's quite a deprived area of Somerset and um, we set up a, a mindfulness and art group there and I've had some really powerful stories from that just just for people being able to access and learn how to do to mindfully um, observe the, the just the area around them you know and and and, and actually go out and visit a wetland or wildfire trust at Sturt Marshes which is absolutely beautiful mm -hmm. yeah it sounds absolutely beautiful and it sounds like every, all of those parts were knitted together in a really lovely way and there was lots of um, synergy between different organisations and the community to actually, like you say, get the best out of everyone, but connect people up so that yeah. we're all kind of working from the same page or supporting each other anyway to do our own expertise, but to kind of create that environment and that group of, of support. Um, you mentioned obviously that was kind of set up a, a, a after or during the pandemic, and obviously we know that's had a really big impact on people's lives. Mm -hmm. um, what do you think? What do you think the impact of social prescribing has been in your region? in terms of looking at some of the difficulties and challenges that the pandemic has actually brought up or highlighted? Um, from, from the conversations, because we, we, we uh, at the road shows, we asked people what have the challenges been to access and social prescribing events, what, we could, what could we do to support them better? Mm. And transport was one of the number one issues, obviously long-term funding, so projects, because all the feedback I've been getting from the projects we've supported is, I've really enjoyed it. And, and like the lady in, in, in the archeology span film, they actually devastated when they have to it has to end because they're only funded for a certain time so you know sustainability is is, is something that we really need to think about um but yeah the, the challenges have been actually knowing about the activities happening so having these shared forums has been really beneficial so people can share information and know where these activities are listed or know who to go to ask to see what activities are available in their area Mm -hmm. and and actually just being able to access them on the confidence of people to go out again after after being at home so for so long you know they've got a certain fear about going out and and just um not having that social experience you know actually having the confidence and most of the groups that we've been uh, the groups the activities that we've commissioned have been quite small it's supported groups and um, for example the the, the earn a bike project in in bridgewater which was an existing charity that helps people learn how to strip down and rebuild their bikes and actually keep the bike at the end of it which is a brilliant project and <laughs> um, we paired them up with Somerset films so they could learn digital skills to learn how to film themselves uh, doing it and that only had two participants but 
um, this is a brilliant story. They, um, one participant was an 18 year old who had to access the activity with a support worker. And the other participant was a 73 year old lady who wants to learn new skills and actually learn how to maintain a bike so she could get out with her partner. Wow, that's amazing. So they would never have met or never had a chance to, to do that activity together without having this project and having it funded. That is amazing. Like you say, the, the, the benefits there are just so large, aren't they, in terms of intergenerational communication, mm -hmm. understanding. Like you say, they probably would never, ever have met had it not been for that project. So yeah. that's incredible. Thank you so much for everything you're doing. And thank you for coming here today as well to share all your experiences. It's thank been you. absolutely brilliant. So so that's been on a, on a regional, on a community level. And then obviously the national level, we've already heard a lot about Art by Post this morning. And we're going to hear more in one of the later sessions as well about Art by Post, because obviously that connected people's stories across a nation. So you can really see how there's that individual level, there's that regional level, and there's that national level in terms of how social prescribing is enabling people to change their stories and to live their lives how they want to live. So um, without further ado, I'm just going to now ask and open up the audience really for a few questions and, and comments and reflections. If anyone's got any, anyone would like to ask our brilliant panelists anything, that would be fantastic. Hopefully we'll get someone to ask a question. Oh, here we go. <laughs> So for the first pilot, um, as I kind of mentioned earlier, we sort of um, connected with charities that we'd worked with before that we know worked with the kind of people that we wanted to benefit from the project. Um, but sort of moving forward, we have another pilot that's starting in, in April um, that we know we've very gratefully got funding for. Um, and we've been trying to make connections with um, link workers and, and it has been quite a long process. We're kind of lucky in York that we have um, what's the, called the Ways to Wellbeing team um, that sits within um, our VCS. Um, and they are looking to kind of embed uh, link workers in kind of secondary services across the city. So it's, it's fairly well established in York. Um, and through that, we've managed to kind of get the word out about the project. Um, and we've now have link workers who are approaching us. Um, but we're, we're sort of looking at how we can balance working with the non-statutory partners and the kind of the individuals that are referred to the, the NHS and the link workers. Um, and, and it's something that is kind of ongoing at the moment. We're just sort of working out those relationships and how it's going to work. Um, but, you know, I think it's the social prescribing landscape, as we all know, sort of looks different in the various different places in the country. And we are looking to kind of take our um, archaeology on prescription model further afield to um, places like Nottingham and Sheffield, where we have other offices. Um, and sort of work with other um, archaeological organisations like um, Wessex and, and places like that. So I think it's just, um, for us, we've been quite lucky that it is quite established, um, but it's still very much sort of a work in progress. And I feel like I've not really given you any kind of, <laughs> any tips there, but. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, come, come and find me because I feel like I can talk I, I about it. you should talk over coffee, definitely, yeah. 100%. Can I, can I add? Can I talk about being part of the wider system? Yeah. It's important so opportunities don't get lost in their own little silo. And, you know, we're just developing a heritage link work. Yeah. And, um, you know, it's a two year sort of try and sort of test and try and see what happens sort of thing. Thank you. I think Anne wanted to comment. I, I think. just wanted to add, um, you know, from my experience, um, the project, the project I'm working on, we have three core funding partners, which is Somerset Wildlife Trust, Somerset Artworks and Spark. 
but we have a wider steering group and on that steering group we have partners from the CCG, from public health, from the Citizens Advice Bureau, from the wider um, you know, advisory mm. bodies and actually that's really helped because that has increased engagement and actually saying well we're already doing this perhaps we could collaborate um, for example one of our roadshow events and um, we collaborated with the Citizens Advice because they normally do a winter wellbeing event so that was a really good opportunity to bring the people who would come in you know for, for helping people to heat their homes and, 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 and mental health support and financial well-being and discharge teams to come and join our event and actually that that has had actually produced um, a really good my seventh project which is uh, postcards mm -hmm. recovery which um local hospital art um, arts coordinator mm -hmm. is developing postcards for people coming home from hospital to have an activity to do for, for seven days so yeah, that was purely from a conversation at one of these networking events. Mm, fantastic. Thank you so much. Thank you for that question. It's really good to share learning and experience, isn't it? So we can all kind of um, learn ourselves. I think, unfortunately, um, we haven't really got time for any other questions. Sorry, I'm just a bit aware of time. Um, but I want to say thank you so much to Katrina and Anne for coming all the way and sharing your incredible work and what you do. Can we all give them a round of applause for coming? <laughs> And I want to say a big thank you to all the participants who are in those films and videos, everyone who's shared their story, who's been open enough to be vulnerable to share their experiences because it helps all of us. So thank you. Thank you to all of you for listening, for, for paying attention, for being engaged. Um, please fill in your postcards about your story within social prescribing. We'd love to see those. Please share them on social media and get talking because that's what this is all about. Um, I'm just going to leave you now with a very short clip to, to finish off, a little bit more podcast on prescription, why not? Um, I hope you enjoy it. I hope it's, this has inspired you. Um, thank you for all you do. Keep inspiring other people to live the life that they would like to live. Thank you so much. Nature is your garden. Nature is your houseplant. Nature is your local park. Uh, nature is the moss that's growing on the wall outside your school. And those things are really, really important. And we are genetically um, b uh, built to respond to nature. It's about where I'm at now, where do I want to go, and what small, tangible thing can I do today and tomorrow? that can help me move forward. Um, so yeah, I think that financial prescribing is not very well known at the moment, but I think it could become a really important part of the toolbox for addressing people's overall um, kind of issues with their well-being and, and getting people to a better place. Do, do you think that social prescribing would have, would have helped you at that point in your journey? Yes, because I think a, an, an additional benefit of social prescribing is that you when you connect with somebody, you're also exchanging information. With lockdown, they realised that the rest of the world, sometimes for the first time, understood what it was like to be isolated from the people you care about, from the people you work with. And so it made people understand how difficult it is to be isolated. Every time I've ever picked anybody up and taken them for their job or taken to get their hair done or wherever, I have got more out of that than it's cost me. Definitely. 100%. And I like being in the car talking to people, driving about, doing nothing. You know, that's, that's, that's what my job is, and, and I wasn't doing that, so hey, that's why I do it. The water doesn't care. It really does not care about who you are, what you look like, are you, do you have a disability, are you able-bodied, you know, it doesn't care, it really does not care. And that's where I think social prescribing is so amazing.